pride goeth before the fall. All of us on some level experience pride, which is not to be mistaken with confidence. At times we find ourselves walking a tight rope between the two. Confidence is based in knowledge and experience and thus has roots. Whereas pride is based in ego, and so it is fragile and sensitive to criticism. In the face of adversity, confidence, even when misplaced, typically leads to learning from one's mistakes, as well as the ability to adapt and overcome failures. When possessed by pride, obstacles and the inevitable failures of life will typically lead to shame and self-hatred. Pride engenders arrogance and denial, and so one cannot grow when possessed by it. Bruce Lee once said, showing off is a fool's idea of glory, and it is not hard to see how many of us have prideful positions and attitudes. Many times this stems from insecurity, and since these feelings are negative, many repress them unconsciously and will carry themselves in a polar manner in spite of their true feelings. The mistake lies in the individual assessment of reward. A confident and reasonable person will see that the rewards they receive from work and behavior are for their actions. A prideful person assumes that it is me being rewarded. So instead of seeing the value of hard work, skills and progression, a form of entitlement presents itself. And since it is based in ego, one desires further praise and admiration from others to uphold their self-image. A mature person will see the value in what they do in relation to their own morals, experiences and values. They realize, like many great masters, that it is the value they seize from their work and effort, and not so much what others think of it, or the material rewards. The anthem of a prideful person is, I have to live through others. Whereas a mature and confident person says, I have to live with myself. One does not have to look further than the internet to see the abundant display of prideful opinions and positions. The far left and right positions of the political spectrum are rife with such attitudes, both of which are engaged in a war of spoils, with moral and ethical opinions being the source of their prideful dogma. All thoughts of racial, mental or political superiority are merely pathetic attempts of the ego to take credit for something it did nothing to obtain. As I have said before, the ego does not achieve anything. It is an illusion, and an illusion cannot generate authentic choice or truth. It is merely a catalyst for chaos and misguided change. The ego serves a purpose, but like all purposes, it is meant to be transcended and overcome. I suggest you avoid prideful people. Their hubris is their Achilles tendon. You do not need to interfere, lest you become the subject of their inevitable derangement. Life will surely humble them in time. Envy, I believe, is the most predominant sin today. One our culture feeds upon at nauseam. One needs to look no further than social media to observe such behavior. We see selective and carefully crafted snapshots of an event or aspect of a person's life. Yet it is clear this is done to convince you, no, themselves, that they are living a good life. We see videos and pictures of celebrities living supposed lavish lifestyles. We see influencers who provide nothing useful to society, yet make abhorrent amounts of money doing so. We see models and athletes that are chiseled like Greek gods or shaped in unrealistic proportions. We see millionaires and billionaires playing with money and people's lives as though it was nothing but an afterthought. How can we not be envious? How can we not feel jealous of those who are born with looks, talents, and good health? How can we justify hard work and honesty when liars and criminals run our country and bodies of power? This is the thorn that lies within the flower of envy. It seems alluring and justified to think this way, but much like a rose, we may cut ourselves when we grasp it. We all know comparison is the thief of joy, but in the grips of something beautiful, charming and alluring, we lose our footing on the grounds of reason. We fail to see that the rose shall wither, and we fail to see that the flower itself has no value, but the value we place upon it. We should question what we value as a society and how we feel about it as individuals. Beauty is often dependent on scarcity and rarity. So then why do we value the rose as the symbol of a beautiful flower, when it is all too common? Why are certain traits and looks considered the symbol of beauty and value in our society? Because certain corporations, governments and powerful institutions have the money, resources and manpower 
to learn how to cultivate human behavior and patterns, and use that knowledge to influence our thoughts and perceptions. From the grocery store to social media, psychological tricks and manipulation are being used to pull you into their system, or to convince you to buy into their vision, belief, or product. If these institutions reward certain traits and lifestyles, then we too will follow. This is because humans are a tribal species. What the majority believes must be correct. We are raised to think in a scarcity mindset. We feel as though we deserve a good life, and that someone else less deserving, or someone who has suffered less than we have, is unrightfully obtaining our potential. It benefits the controllers of power and wealth to keep us angry at each other. Just look at the anger between men and women, black and white, developed countries and non-developed countries. While we should take responsibility for our place in life and our decisions, we have to also acknowledge we have been played. Just look at the world ten years ago. What has happened to us as a society? More than ever does envy and wrath rule our hearts and minds. We have been psychologically manipulated into following movements, brands, parties and institutions that in our right minds we never would have followed previously. We are told what is valuable, beautiful and moral, and the people who wield the power lie and change history before our very eyes. They gaslight you and convince you that lies are truth, that pain is pleasure, that up is down and that wrong is right. We are told it is progress, but it is a trap that consumes our minds and souls. Most people are followers and don't wish to bear the burden of critical thought. They are too busy living in illusion to confront the painful and isolating nature of our current reality. I believe much of this lies in pride, but largely in envy. We think that if we say the right things, puppet a certain agenda, select a certain side, wear the right clothes and do certain things, we too may get a slice of the pie. This is why art is dying. The power of money and the allure of success has shaped the collective conscious through the manipulation of media, corporations and governmental bodies. Once we see this and study the lies and manipulations fed to us, we can begin to gain sight of what is actually presented to us. The plastic dolls paraded around do not reflect the reality of women, nor do the men who abuse drugs and surgeries reflect the reality of men. The artists we see living a lavish lifestyle are almost always broke and owned by their label. The celebrities we worship were typically abused since childhood and are controlled by handlers and agents. We may see a rich businessman, but we don't see his broken marriage or the kids he never spends time with. The people we see on social media flaunting a fun lifestyle are typically lost, miserable, and unsure of themselves. While this isn't the case for every individual or situation, with practice, we begin to see into such matters with more clarity and perspective and realize all things have pros and cons. We see our burning desire and envious mindset is really nothing but a poorly thought out assumption. Even if someone is successful or rich, who's to say one day we won't be as well? Who's to say the rich man won't be broke one day, the model ugly, the liar exposed? Does it really matter? When we are following our purpose and seeing life as a school and not a cage, that we are free to relax and focus on our journey, our path, our strengths and our weaknesses. We will always want more or want what we don't have when in the grips of envy. Escape the illusion of reality and see that everything you need you already possess. You must simply take hold of it. Like most deadly sins, they are typically symbiotic. Pride many times leads to wrath and follows greed. We are prideful of ourselves and thus cannot accept slights from others. Or maybe it is pride in our religions or beliefs that lead us to justify slaughter and subjugation. And while the predominant idea of wrath is outright violence and retaliation, in the modern Western world, wrath depicts itself in more occulted and insidious ways. The average person is not committing acts of terror or abuse on others because our society has rules and punishments in place that typically deter the average layman from engaging in duels or physical assaults. We instead see a wrath that uses morals and labels to subjugate opposition. Truth does not fear questions and a truthful and decent person does not try and silence opposing views. When you tear out a man's tongue, you are not proving him a liar. You're only telling the world that you fear what he might say. The internet mob embodies this stereotype perfectly. Even their own are not safe from their wrath. Much like lust, 
Wrath is a void that consumes and fractalizes itself into more and more complicated excuses for depravity. It is an appetite, and once certain people have tasted blood, they want more. The wrath of trolls and agitators is similar, as both parade intellectual or moral superiority, but in reality both enjoy watching the world burn. A self-serving and destructive addiction that is hidden behind a guise of ethical erectness. One cannot rationalize the horrors of nature and man unless they attach a purpose to it. The fact is, there is an abundance of people who feel disenfranchised by life. While some feelings are justified, much of it is based in poor personal decisions. The need to feel morally right, coupled with the burning need for admiration and control, creates a deadly combination. One where the person gets to be the victim and the perpetrator. The consequences of the wrath they dish out is only further fuel to justify their oppression and thus more retaliation. All people entangled in wrath are coming from a mindset of oppression. They feel insulted, attacked, threatened or provoked in one way or another. It is unfortunate that well-meaning religions, political groups or identities are infiltrated by those who see an opportunity for dominance and justification of hatred. Humans are quite good at deflecting internalized negative feelings towards others, and sadly, it is commonplace. Say the wrong thing, purchase services from the wrong people, dress the wrong way, make a bad joke and you may find yourself ruined, jobless and without help. A rational person can hardly see the point of this, other than the aim of oppression and personal gain. If we truly wish to inform others and seek truth and rationality, we would allow people to speak their truth and either make a case or make a fool of themselves. Ruining someone's life, pushing them out of society and vilifying them, only creates more radical people who will seek expression in whatever form they can. This behavior only continues the cycle of wrath and creates the very monsters they supposedly want eradicated. You do not eradicate demons. You do not get rid of monsters. You live with them. You accept their nature, and you attempt to work with them towards a better solution. You cannot eradicate hatred with more hatred. Anyone who thinks they can is the most dangerous monster of them all. Cut off one head of the Hydra and another grows. Take down one criminal and another will be there tomorrow. Destroy the leader of a terrorist group and more assailants will join the cause. The same applies to your own demons. Try and suppress and dominate them and they will come back stronger and in the most unexpected ways. You have to use truth and intelligence to tame a beast. When gluttony comes to mind, we typically think of someone who is overweight or someone who has a ravenous appetite. Yet the concept of gluttony stems from more than just intake of food or products. It is in the mindset which the problem lies. Gluttony shares many similarities to greed and lust yet takes on a different aspect. Gluttony being defined as habitual greed or excess in eating. It is not food or excess weight that is sinful, but the damage and disrespect it cultivates when abused. Our bodies are a temple, and so are the bodies of other living things. It is one thing to eat another living creature out of a need for substance. It is another to engage in food as a purely pleasure-based pursuit. The mass slaughter of animals and wasting of resources going into this addiction is what makes it sinful. Even veganism results in the mass death of life, as crops need heavy amounts of pesticides, chemicals, wildlife management and other means of crop preservation that destroy ecosystems and wild game. We take for granted the abundance we possess, and we waste resources that in another part of the world or time in history would be fought and paid for in blood. This is not meant to be a lecture on environmentalism or capitalistic society, but a perspective to have when engaging in excess. The natives of this country used to harvest every part of the animal and revered and respected the animals they hunted. It is wicked to take life so mindlessly. We look at a dog or a cat and cannot imagine harming the creature, let alone eating it. Yet day in and day out, 25 million animals are slaughtered daily to feed our addiction. The damage to our organs, bones, and stomachs are creating more and more suffering for individuals and the people around them. The burden it places on the healthcare system and the burden it places on society's standards is also something to consider. The mental space of someone who is gluttonous 
is someone who fails to see the scope of their behaviors and is consumed in the carbon reality of the material world. It is poetic that life is engorging itself on their souls, consuming them in return. Because someone who is obsessed with physicality, material and excess, will eventually be consumed by the nature of their actions. Being an activist or animal rights lover doesn't void you from this either. As all products, luxuries and services come at the expense of something or someone else. It is the law of equivalent exchange. Everything we do takes from something else. We cannot avoid this aspect of life, nor should we put too much emphasis on this topic. But we should try and appreciate the abundance of food, products and services we have access to. It's okay to feast. It's okay to have comfort food. It's okay to be a little overweight. Just do not delude yourself into thinking that an eating addiction or disorder is healthy or without consequence to other living things. There is no need to shame yourself for your body. Just try and value the cost of your decisions. Because someone who doesn't value other lives and living things cannot value their own. Much like gluttony, lust is an appetite as well, meaning it can never be permanently satisfied or fulfilled. It is an endless void that expands and consumes when left unchecked. Sexual motivation and energy is the secret to many great men's success. Just think of the amount of energy people put into sexual pursuits. Now think about how that energy might be applied towards something else. There is a reason a muse is needed for artists, and this is especially true for males. The generation and cultivation of sexual energy leads a man to courage, self-control, and strokes of genius. Do we ever ask why most lewd content on the internet is free? Why is it so easily accessible and displayed? Profit, perhaps. But all coins have two sides. The aim, I believe, is not only the degradation of the family structure and gender relations, but the weakening of people's minds and creative capacity. Many religions and movements demonize and attach shame to sexuality, and I believe this too is harmful to our minds and motivations. But the allure of sexuality is even more harmful as you rarely see people addicted to chastity, but many people addicted to sexual gratification. This sexual propaganda pushes us to see people as objects and less so divine beings. It creates inferiority complexes, impulsive behavior and the development of addictive pathways. The people who control us want us to be scared, unhealthy and miserable, weak in mind and body, implanting in us a feeling of lacking something, that life is short and meaningless that we should engage in pleasure and consume products until we die. Sex is nothing to take lightly. Being with partner after partner over time is proven to cause commitment issues in most people and leads to overall dissatisfaction in future relationships. The illusions on the screen are not comparable to most real-life sexual encounters. And sadly, many children and young people are seeing these scenes and fantasies as reality, as it is their first encounter with sexuality. Nothing is more alluring than sex, and sex sells for a reason. It is the single most powerful motivator on the planet. So is it any wonder why men and women feel more objectified? Why more and more people are not engaging in real relationships, and instead opting for digital transactions as a filler for the real thing? Is it any wonder why so many children are born out of wedlock? Why so many people have diseases and sexual trauma? We are being taught on a massive scale, to throw away the greatest source of magic humans possess. The transmutation of sexual energy, the potential for life, the potential for greatness, the potential for a family. Each time we engage in pointless sexual activities, we are lowering ourselves to that of an animal. This is not to demonize sex or sexual relations, as God gave us this gift and commanded we multiply. But we should attempt to reduce the amount of degrading and distorted media we consume and we should stop viewing people as casual partners, as we are demoting ourselves to such as well. I have seen this addiction countless times, and it is predominant in our society. Sometimes it seems it is all some people have to offer, instead of developing a personality or respectable characteristics. Do not demonize sexuality. It is wonderful and truly a gift. But do not disgrace that gift. Develop a deeper perspective and vision towards this aspect and I can assure you your life and circumstances will change for the better. Today more than ever, 
we are blessed and cursed with endless forms of entertainment. Vast seas of information and material that could captivate our minds till the end of time. While this is quite the treat, too much of a good thing can be our undoing. The producers and managers of such content spend ample time trying to make their products more and more captivating and appeal to our shorter and shorter attention spans. They know what grabs people's attention and create their products and services with the intention of being addictive. We are only given so much time in this life, and while we know one day we will die, we live and act as though we will not. The issue, however, lies less in not being productive, but more so in what complacency brings. The quote, idle hands are the devil's workshop, is said for a reason. A person who is bored will typically look for mischief or trouble. This can be observed in animals as well. Put them in a cage with nothing to do, and before you know it, they are killing each other. There's a growing movement of people who feel disillusioned by society and the modern rat race, and so they attempt to withdraw from it altogether. There is this conception that retirement is the goal of work itself. The misconception many people have is that they need to do something they feel passionate about. But passion does not always equal competency. Just because we want something does not mean it belongs to us. No matter what work we are doing, we will at some point feel it is repetitive or mundane. The truth is, we enjoy things that we are good at. A person who says they don't enjoy math is likely someone who is not good at it. Yet a person who is good at math will likely find it more pleasurable. Many young people want meaningful work, but they gauge this by the standard society places on what meaningful means. We cannot all be doctors and architects. Many don't see the value of blue-collar labor and just how significant, important, and skillful it really is. Almost every job has significant opportunity if you look for it. While college can be a great thing, it is many times believed to be a mandatory duty, and countless youth go into massive debt for a useless degree. Instead of teaching people the value of skills and common sense, we instead teach them to follow instructions and do as they are told. I believe this mind-numbing and left-brained approach to labor and learning is fueling people's discontent with work. The ever-growing wealth gap and costs of living do not help this either. We don't teach people to think creatively and be resourceful. With the right mindset and attitude, any work can prove entertaining and insightful. But because most people do not realize this, and because of the endless access to idealized lifestyles and fantasies, people feel even more discouraged to try and navigate themselves to a better financial situation in life. Instead, many opt for quick and degrading methods of making money. And this thinking is reinforced by the quick and fast-paced forms of entertainment, food and sexual gratification that is dominate in our society. Everything in our modern world is designed to be faster, cheaper and more affordable. But they are rarely built to last. And so, we see people that are not built to last. They will do anything to get their five minutes of fame. Scamming, lying, clickbaiting, and so on. This is a form of sloth, as they wish to get around honest and consistent work, in favor of quick and cheap tricks. If you aren't working for your keep, somebody else is paying for you. The idea the world can run on entertainers and useless professions is one that is all too common. When hard times come, and they will, those with skills and common sense will never be without opportunity. Those who took the easy way and wasted their youth and potential will be left derelict in a sea of misfortune. And this is the true danger of sloth. It is a slow death of the body and the soul. Someone right now is working to keep your lights on, your water clean, and your systems intact. If we all start to give up in favor of meaningless pleasure, there will be no pleasures left that we are accustomed to. People say on your deathbed, I doubt you'll be thinking, wow, I wished I worked more. But I doubt even less will say, I wish I wasted more time on pointless entertainment and distractions. At least work provides us the ability to eat better food, live in better homes, buy better products, and provide better lives for ourselves and loved ones. Much like how lewd content convinces our brains we are actually successful in terms of reproduction, video games and other forms of entertainment can fool our brains into thinking we are accomplishing goals and being rewarded for it. We can bypass the biological requirements put in place and juice the dopamine out of our brains. Yet we have learned nothing, we have produced nothing, and we have traded it for precious time. 
Much like the sins listed above, greed is rooted in our biology and subconscious currents. In the modern world, survival is much easier than ever before. Even a poor person in the first world has luxuries even kings did not in past times. We take for granted that the lights are on, that our water is clean, that we have laws and rules that work well enough to keep order, and that we have endless knowledge at the tips of our fingers. Rivers of blood have flowed for much less. A piece of land, a pound of spice, the gaze of a woman, has created the deaths of thousands of souls, and yet in the West, we feel such privileges are owed to us. Our minds have not adapted to this brave new world. We may believe material wealth can save us, but it cannot. We may believe it will bring us happiness, and yes, it will to some degree, but it cannot save you from the person in the mirror or the weight of our actions. Money is not good, nor is it evil. Much like a tool, a weapon, or an idea, it is the wielder that bears that title. Wealth comes and goes, but knowledge and skills are the generators of success. There are many shortcuts to wealth, but few for success. A wealthy man can lose his fortune many times in their life, but always find his way back there. A poor man can have millions, but when he inevitably loses it, he will almost always remain in the same spot he fell. The saying, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime, holds more truth than we realize. Yet the greed of knowledge is just as deadly as any. Many believe this is why we suffer to begin with, and why we fell from grace. However, I will argue that no knowledge is evil. It is once again who wields it. Knowledge is truth, and truth is the essence of God. So it is what we do with money, what we do with knowledge, and what we do with power that dictates our direction in our journey in life. Cultivating and learning from life and your mistakes might be hard, but I assure you it is worth it. Because if we choose to feel bad for ourselves and make excuses, our evolution from this suffering and weight we feel is impossible. The temptations of the flesh are exceedingly hard to navigate through, and sometimes we may feel confused as to why we must endure it at all. But in a world so mysterious and unforgiving, we have to utilize our curiosity and faith in a better tomorrow to survive the trials of our time here. In time, all truths will be revealed. As you continue to view challenges and failures as learning opportunities, you will begin to see the humor and beauty of it all. It might be hard, but I know you can do it.